Okay. So, welcome everyone to our um, March virtual um, meeting in uh, equestrian history. And today we are going to have a round table on horse and rider relationship. Um, we have five wonderful speakers who are going to share their insights, their opinions on the topic. Um, so just a brief background why I wanted to have this uh, meeting on uh, this topic as a round table. So um, uh, this year um, we had, uh, or last year we had the, the Olympic Games in Tokyo, Summer Olympic Games, and uh, as usual, Olympic Games have scandal. This year it was something that happened in modern pentathlon that triggered my attention. I always loved modern pentathlon because it's it's a discipline which is new, but it has historical roots. Uh, it's got fighting, it's got uh, shooting, it's got swimming, running, everything, and of course horses. And of the dream of modern soldier. And then what happened was so much unlike what should happen to a soldier. Probably people know what what happens there. Uh, if not, you can look up on the news that I, I was thinking, what is happening to the horse and rider relationship in this in the modern world? And uh, there was so much criticism of a question events in the Olympics. Some people uh, I've seen were arguing that um, all the question events should be removed for the, from the Olympic games for ethical reasons. And um, that's why I wanted to host this meeting and to invite people who are coming from different disciplines we have Katerina, who is uh, doing modern pentathlon at the Latvian Academy of Sport Education. She's a student. We have Svetlana, uh, who is a rider, a doctoral student at the Sports Academy as well. So she is doing this um, modern equestrian uh, activities, which are in the Olympic Games. She's going to tell about her a little more. Um, and we have three people who are doing something different. We have uh, Alessia and Jack um, who are joining us from Ireland. And um, Alessia has a background in, um, okay, um, um, uh, in a kind of Western writing. Um, she sent you a biography. I'm, I'm not going to read uh, this because I'm sure she's going to tell about this herself, but um, she's been doing very, very different thing. Um, and uh, she's been doing uh, um, Western practices, um, something. Um, she's she's uh, learned um, in the US, she's been training in the United States, and we've got Jack Gassman, um, who has been um, uh, teaching and um, doing martial arts and a question martial arts. He's been a historian writing on 15th century cavalry tactics, and um, yeah, so doing lots of uh, things which are historical and which are a question. And uh, we have Joachim uh, Lovgren. Um, so I've heard, I first uh, found out about his work with horses when I was uh, listening to a podcast of Exarch, which is a journal um, of... Um, uh, experimental archaeology so he is doing also work with horses which is experimental which is based on history and uh, I'm sure he will bring us a different perspective on this so um, I would uh, like each of our speakers to introduce themselves to say a few words about them uh, their experience in horsemanship. And um, next, we will open the floor for 
questions of, and for general discussion. So maybe Katerina uh, Krejci could start and then there will be Svetlana and uh, um, Alessia and Jack and then uh, Joachim, if you're all right with this order. Yes. Okay, so Katerina, could you start? I would like to uh, share my screen. Uh, but I have some problems with it. So I don't know. I now, yeah. I'm sorry, wait a little bit. No, there is no problem. If, if. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want, we can. Uh, yes. So, uh, if Katerina has problem, maybe we could start with uh, Svetlana. You okay with? If we start with you. I think yes. We can yeah. start. Okay. You can kill me, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. I'll try to share also. I haven't just a moment. It's okay. Yes, everything is perfect. Okay, uh, I haven't prepared something special for the presentation. Uh, first of all, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Gl glad to see you. And congratulations to everyone on the arrival of spring. Uh, in Latvia, now it's sunny. I hope in, in your country the same. And I wish you green and sunny spring uh, as well, which will pass in an equally sunny summer. As for the Topicality of the topic, it's important to note its essence because the topic borders uh, on ethics and its principles as well. From a personal point of view, nowadays everything happens in such a sensitive environment uh, because historically the demands have changed when it comes to uh, sport that are closer to me. And what I want to say a little bit about myself. Uh, I have been in equestrian sport for 22 years this year uh, and mostly representative of the show jumping discipline than some other uh, nowadays classical disciplines uh, like dressage, for example. But uh, in the middle, I also learned the basics of the dressage. I have been the coach of the Latvian Equestrian Federation for 14 years, also worked in St. Petersburg for three years, both as a trainer and working with new horses, preparing them for uh, various disciplines according to the purpose and potential of their exposition. Uh, at the moment, I am uh, a student of second year doctoral studies uh, in Latvian Academy of Sport Education. There I got also a bachelor and master degree in science of sport, depending work uh, works directly in equestrian sport. Um, going back to the sport itself, uh, it must be said that in equestrian sport, at least in recent years, the great attention uh, has been paid to ethical principles. Uh, the Horse Welfare Court, uh, which, uh, which includes ethical principles, has been operated in Latvia for many years. Um, the code highlights the horse as a key element as well as its uh, treatment of its everyday life and also uh, in this sport. Of a couple of years uh, ago, uh, the Latvian Equestrian Federation established a code of ethics that included such basic principles as general principles uh, like uh, general treatment of horse, uh, Horses in everyday life and sport, uh, responsibility for horses like uh, conditions of horse keeping uh, care, including uh, the need to move horses, transportation, and feeding, which must uh, not be accessed. Uh, it's like violence, whip, uh, using of spurs, uh, raw cure, for example, and some physical abuse. And uh, the last point includes points that. Uh, forward and changing in both uh, food and 
maintenance culture uh, and so on. Uh, equestrian sport are a close cooperation of two athletes and it must not be forgotten about the rider himself. I would like to say that the happy horse uh, is a happy rider and uh, the same back. Um, in the article, horse and rider uh, are partners by Annika McGivern is said, uh, if I would like, I, I would, uh, I will try to uh, read the cita citation of this. If we do not think of ourselves as athletes, we won't treat ourselves like athletes. If we don't see ourselves as an important element of the partnership, we won't invest in ourselves by looking after our bodies and our minds. With the same care and attention, we give our horses. Because of this, equestrians often uh, end up mentally and emotionally exhausted by their sport, which directly impacts performance ability. This, uh, this execution can also have uh, a negative impact uh, on day-to-day -day efforts uh, to improve ourselves and our horses as well. Uh, at the end of the day, if we are mentally, emotionally and physically burnt out, we cannot be the rider and partner our horses deserve to have. We cannot be the most successful high-performing version of ourselves. The idea of this author shows uh, the essence of necessity of mental, physical, and spiritual uh, feedback of two living creatures. The working relationship uh, between horses and writer is a unique uh, uh, association requires cooperation between both uh, to achieve the goals of humans uh, in their selected equestrian sport. It is the moment uh, that the horse is what helps a person achieve their desired goals that must not uh, allow a person to use the horse as a tool to achieve certain goals, whether or not it's a sport. We as educated people need to raise a new generation of people who need to be able to analyze and evaluate the use on what a horse is and how to evaluate it. In sport, you must be able to evaluate first of all our ambitions, our own and uh, our horse's skills, needs, talents and abilities. And we as living beings of higher intelligence on earth must realize that it's not uh, the horse that needs uh, the sport. We need it, nor has uh, he invented it. Not every person today can be a dancer, also horses. Not every can jump good and, uh, and do it well and jump high uh, and jump in Olympic Games, uh, for example. Not everyone is plastic at birth. He must be aware of it. And sometimes he has to give up without forcing the horse to do what he is not able to do. When it comes to ambitious young people, as trainers, we need to be able to teach uh, you to understand, feel the horse in all possible categories. Only then we will there be a successful cooperation performance of two creatures in sport. Uh, what I would like to say in the end, I definitely recommend finding a common uh, denominator with the animal because who does not, not like good cooperation? Okay, I think I will finish on it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, all right. Katerina is back. And uh, I'll share the screen for her in a moment. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, Katerina will, will be speaking. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, yes. this funny way. Okay. <laughs> 
I think I'll share it as the way it opens, uh, the way it opens on my screen. Otherwise, it might take long time. Uh, okay, Katerina, you could. Uh, I'll share the second slide, and uh, you can speak. Okay, that's, uh, so my name is Katerina, and I'm a member of Latvian Modern Pentathlon uh, senior team. Uh, I'm originally from the Czech Republic, so also my training, horse riding training in modern pentathlon started uh, in Czech Republic. And uh, in uh, my own experience, I see a lot of problems in our sport. And uh, unfortunately, everyone could see it also on the Olympic Games. And uh, so from my experience, uh, I started uh, to do horse riding at the age of 17. And actually horse riding competition started start, uh, starts in modern pentathlon at the age of 19. So we have uh, like only three years to learn uh, how to ride a horse. Uh, I'm, uh, it's uh, it's only in Czech Republic, actually. I don't know how is it in, in other countries, but it's almost impossible to to learn uh, everything on horses, uh, to build some relationship, to understand horses, because we our training is really time demanding, and we do horse riding training only once or twice a week. Uh, it's like 45 minutes and uh, often uh, we just go uh, came to the stable and hor horse is already prepared so we just take a horse and go to perform our training so we we don't spend a lot of time with horses because we actually we don't have time for it because we have four uh, more disciplines and uh, so it's the first problem. And the second problem is that our competition, uh, our competition rules horse, in horse riding discipline is qu are quite, uh, quite strict. And uh, the situation that happened in the Olympic Games actually happens almost in every competition, I mean, um, World Cups. Almost every time someone gets zero points, uh, almost every time they are, um, the athletes don't treat the horses quite well, we can see it. I could see it many times because the athletes don't know what to do. They, they didn't have uh, experience with it. And uh, so, so it's the complicated situation. And our federation did the solution uh, which um, I don't uh, understand actually that um, next Olympic Games will be the last Olympic Games with these disciplines and after that modern pentathlon won't be pentathlon anymore. Uh, yeah, the horse riding discipline will be cancelled. So, so it's the future of, of our sport and actually no one knows what will happen, what will be our fifth disciplines, but it definitely won't be horse riding uh, just now. So I think it's, it's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. And Katerina didn't mention, but she also had problems with horse riding, which she overcame very triumphantly. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I can explain yeah. it if you want. Uh, okay. Uh, so yes, last season was my first season uh, under the Latvian flag. I I did international competitions in juniors because I was last year in juniors. I uh, I had two most important competitions, um, European Championship and uh, World Championship. And unfortunately, I fell down on the un uh, Junior European Championship once, but I, I finished the race with uh, really low points. And uh, the one week after that on the European Junior, Junior World Championship, I fell down twice. So it means zero points. So 
I, th I thought that it's disaster. I won't <laughs> to do this part anymore, but my coach, horse riding coach, did a lot of work with me. I spent uh, five trainings a week on horses. I, I actually lived in stable <laughs> to understand horses. And then um, two months, no man, four months after that, we had a youth 24 European championship and I, I had full points, 300 points, because I had actually, uh, I was lucky with the horse also, and I was third, so uh, it was quite ending of my season, 2021. Yeah, and uh, I think it's a wonderful example because it shows it's not the discipline which is wrong or the horse which is bad, it's just the organization of training and it's possible to perform really well also in pentathlon well olympic athletes have been showing this long before and Catherine, in your experience as well from having very low points or zero points you rose to the top it's just because uh, well we need to train that's normal nothing to be ashamed of mm -hmm. and uh, it's normal in the question sports to have five days a week just riding horses or six days a week Sometimes even seven days a week. Um, so it, it's not like it's impossible to do or the sport is at fault. It's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to build a relationship with horse. We need to understand them as uh, other beings. It's not a bicycle. That's why I was really shocked that they wanted to replace with a bicycle. It's like a bad joke. If you cannot ride the horse and you can ride the bicycle. Don't yeah. need a relationship with a bicycle. No one understands it, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's good to yeah. hear that you also and um, kind of approve of this decision. Okay. Uh, I also agree with both of you. Of course, yeah, about Katrin's experience also, and from my own experience, it's too late to start riding at seventeen years. It's too late for them. I think it's not problem with discipline. It's a problem with preparation that's what we what this uh, kind of sport should uh, maybe change i also started riding at 17 not because of uh, some sport or something that's because uh, i didn't have a riding club before this yeah but, the, but 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 there is a difference it's it's a sport or for yourself it's a big yeah. difference well of course if you want to be an athlete and riding at 17 in your sport it's a bit i guess it's a bit too late but actually in pentathlon it's the question of money because when the federation there doesn't have money for for the kids to train they just don't train they train just when it's really necessary and uh, only um, low amount of kids can can train horse riding okay, i think so. it's i think it's a, it's also discussed moment because, for example, we are we are working here in this uh, in Claystia. Yeah? Um, I can't to say that uh, it's very expensive to be in this children group, for example. Mm. Yes, but uh, when you have five disciplines, it's it's for for parents. It's quite quite hard to to pay the trainings for the kids, like. It's only one of the five disciplines I was writing, so that's why. Okay. I think the municipality or the government could do something to pay. For example, I know in Latvia there are some hockey trainings in some uh, cities which are free for kids. So why, if the government, if the state wants to have modern pentathlon, uh, their team uh, to go to the Olympic Games, they could at least find some places for kids which are free. Uh -huh. So it's it's kind of organizational question. It's not for parents who, who should pay for this. I think it should be very interesting in the future to get these costs of the sports, like like hockey, these expensive sports, to get this all on the paper and to look what's happening. Okay, maybe we could uh, let the other three speakers also speak, and then we could return to this. And next we have Alessia and Jack, which are both on one computer, which is not surprising. They are in one place in Ireland. Uh, 
Okay. Well, I introduced myself a little bit because I was never a uh, participant so those, oh, a speaker of, of, of these uh, meetings. So, um, well, my name is Alessia and I was born in Italy, um, uh, but I feel myself a little bit adopted from the US because I spent a lot of time there. Um, I was hooked onto horses since I was uh, very little and they helped me to find uh, peace um, and growing up in the in the outskirts of Milan, uh, that's where I was born. The drive for the horses, uh, to have them like 24-7 in my life and um, the dedication to them uh, pay, uh, brought me to pay for some of my studies and uh, uh, subsequently uh, they uh, kind of like I thanks to them I did meet my teacher Paul Dietz which was uh, I consider him like one of the rare last connections to what I call the world greatest horsemen which is Tom Dorrance and Bill, Bill Dorrance and Ray Hunt and Buck Brandman. Uh, so I moved to the US and I worked with Paul for several years and then after um, after those four or five years that it was I flew back to Europe and with Jack we started our own program uh, where we do live shows uh, about Irish history, myth and legends and we use uh, horses and uh, we combine more like a theatrical aspect to a stunt with uh, swords and other various weapons into it. Um, along with that, I also uh, start a lot of young horses for other people and I give le private lessons to people either on our horses or, um, or their own horses. And what I base my work on is mostly on partnering the person and the horse and them going together. So the background, I'll show a little, some photos that I have. Uh, one second, sorry. So. Okay, well, sorry. Not very practical, but this is like one of the photos I just took in the States in Arizona and the background there was to uh, work a cow. Uh, I, I find that the moment that you partner with the horse you can do a job with them and you don't, you don't have to just be focused on uh, take care of your horse. So your horse can take care of, his, of himself, he can learn a job and he can help you doing it and that is for the working cows or also uh, for doing sorts, for example. Uh, we do some, maybe I do have a picture here of, yeah, of some training we do at home. Uh, this is just a, it's just a rescue horse that I had a few years ago and she was rejected from being a racehorse and from being a polo pony because she was too hot to play polo. And I retrained her, she, was, she came very insecure and very hot headed, but then she gained the confidence uh, by uh, the work that I just put in her and she, I retrained her to become a mounted combat horse. And uh, uh, do, 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 do. That's the same horse and she did help me in the past to train other horses. So some unwanted horses have come over here and very shy, very unconfident. And uh, through the, the work in, that I've been put, put into them and also uh, thanks to the, also in this case to her job that that horse has learned, she has helped me to put the confidence into a horse that didn't have it before. So I perhaps have some young horse that came in training recently. This is a rescue Lusitano that we just got a couple of weeks ago. 
and he is very, very shy. Uh, he just just been gelded and he's 13 years old. So he didn't do anything before in his life. And this is the first half ride that I did on him. I haven't been riding him yet. I think it's pretty close, but that's that's so far where we got to. Uh, and I didn't think that it, within two weeks I could I could do that much, honestly, for with a horse that was locked up in a, in a, in a, in a, in a shed for ten, over 10 years as a stallion also. And this is a really nice ride that I had uh, on another uh, Andalusian horse that came in training. Uh, he threw the owner and he the owner broke his back and the horse came and he's full on. He's a stallion, uh, not 10 years old. He's been just covering mare since and parked in a field for like five years. And then the owner now kind of like woke up and decided he wants to ride the horse again. So, <laughs> so I put the job on me. And this was only a month, a month in with work. Um, and today I had a very soft and little uh, bareback ride on him, just uh, in a halter without a snaffle or anything. And the mare that you see in the back here, she, she's tied to a fence. I didn't want the mare to wander around too much, but she, he's, it's possible to ride him around mare bareback in a halter. So something, something did change in that, in that head. And you go from horses like that to horses that perhaps didn't have problems before and that can perform pretty good into a show. So that's a little mare that I work with uh, for a few years and she's, she's just nice. So she takes care of me when we do the shows and when I do the, a, a lot of the work here. So yeah, that's for me, it's one part that I wanted to emphasize whether it's a competition or a happy hacker or whether a person is doing any kind of job with their horse is that uh, there is that type of partnership that Anastasia was talking about is they're not a bicycle and that because there is a good bond between the uh, owner or the rider and the horse then it is possible to do uh, a job safely and not uh, be led by by fear. A lot of horses that come over here, uh, they're very fearful. But I noticed that, uh, like that stallion that I was just talking about, this one, he doesn't seem on the on this photo, but he came over here. He was all nerves, and when I saw the owner riding him just a couple of weeks ago, the owner is all nerves. So, of course, that fear is trying. It, it moves from the person into the horse. So that's for me, it's an important uh, topic that the rider can give, can, can make the horse feel at peace and safe and not transfer their, their nerves. A lot of horses I see that they are here in training and they are getting pretty good. And then the owner come and visit them. And I notice that the horse changes when the owner is here and the nerves are coming back. And I think that that's, uh, that's, that's a little bit sad. I can't, I can't, uh, I don't have a magic stick to change the, how a person feel with the horse. I know that there is a lot of background often with horses. So um, there are a lot of memories of things that have ha happened before. If someone gets thrown, bucked off, breaks their back, arm, whatever. Uh, but it's important to try to let those baggage go because the horse doesn't know better really they they, they 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 live in the moment and it's important that they can feel at peace and confident uh with us so that's that's uh my that's all i wanted to say for the moment thank you very much alessa what you said it's really important it's yeah sometimes you said it's a bad horse it's a nervous horse it's a crazy horse and it's like at this problem moment, I want to say I've also worked with lots of problem horses. It's like not problem horses, problem owners or problem mm -hmm. riders. Yeah, they say, oh, you, you have you you work with problem horses. I say, I help horses with people problem. <laughs> it's the person problem more than the horse. So 
that's yeah, it's quite often people who have already some problems they come to work with horses and sometimes it works mm -hmm. quite really well the horses can help with the problems sometimes yeah. it just doesn't work it could be the other way around problems can get worse i, I wish the owner stays in training for three months rather than the horse yes yes because uh, if the problems are with the owner not with the horse the horse goes yeah. back and it's the same thing again um yeah but happily i have one horse which came to me because the owner realized she doesn't want this horse she doesn't uh she cannot handle this and she said can i would you want to take a blind horse who is afraid of people I said, yeah i want to have a 20 years old blind horse who is afraid of people. I want to ride it. Yeah. <laughs> what a dream. Oh, she's <laughs> really sweet. Sounds um, like a... <laughs> um, okay, so Jack, maybe you could uh, also talk about yourself. <laughs> okay, so, so a little bit of a background from me. Um, I kind of come at it from two different directions. First of all, I started from the uh, HEMA side, Historical European Martial Arts, which is an effort to uh, reconstruct historical sword fighting and martial arts systems from historical manuscripts that were written at whatever period to teach fencing to people of that period. Um, so usually we take a manuscript, we translate whatever text is in it, um, interpret the techniques that are described, and then try and test these interpretations against each other head on in a competition format to ensure that these interpretations work in non-controlled environments. Um, because the moment you start actually adding psychological pressure to decision-making matrices, things change a lot. So um, just I'll share a couple photos of what I want to do. So, among these historical manuscripts are included also stuff on horseback. Um, so one of the things that are that are a part of this is that we're a pretty young discipline. So we're having a lot of um, experiments with rules, incentivization of different actions, how tweaking rules change athlete behavior. Um, and maybe create a more historical environment or a less historical environment. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Here you see sparring on horseback um, techniques. We also, because you know it's not a sport that pays us money, we also, to make sure we get our training in, we do shows, um, mostly Norman, because that's what's around here in Ireland. Um, so, but yeah. My main bike background is competing internationally and coaching athletes for fencing on foot. There's no competitions on horseback yet. Um, that again runs into a whole bunch of moral questions as far as including horses in a combat sport. Um, but yeah, so again, my background is also, I came to uh, Alessia's ranch uh, American ranch riding background from, uh, I had done Western, I had done some dressage, I'd done some classical dressage. I'd done a whole bunch of different um, equestrian styles uh, growing up. And when I found the kind of old school American uh, ranch horsemanship, I found something that was very practical that focused on working with the horse as a partner to get a job done when you do not have control of the horse. Um, the entire premise is, can you get a job done in deadly circumstances with a rope, a coil, uh, a coiled rope in one hand, impeding your uh, steering, and a rope in the other hand that you have to focus on to rope the cow, um, possibly with very aggressive animals around you in a variety of circumstances and terrains. So I found that very that spoke to me a lot as an athlete uh, that I focus on um, kind of maintaining a partnership where you didn't have to do much. Uh, your horse was with you and accomplishing the job next to you. Um, and as a historian, that also makes made sense a lot to me with what I was seeing in the context for pre-1550 uh, uh, cavalry tactics and culture, especially in the German area or the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm coming from. 
Thank you very much, Axel. That's taking us uh, from uh, from a question sports as they are today to a question sports that were here historically. So, Yoki, maybe you could speak next and tell about his experience and what he is doing with horses. Your thing, um, I uh, just uh, can I share my screen like this? Yes. Not that one. So you see my screen, right? Yeah, that's perfect. Good. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Joachim. Uh, in uh, relation uh, to, uh, I was, uh, yeah, I wanted to do a presentation about myself uh, related to the relation between the horse and the uh, rider. Um, personally, my uh, career as a horseman uh, began uh, at a rather early stage. Um, my, I grew up on a farm and my mom always had horses and uh, she also uh, asked if I would like to go out, out horseback riding with her some uh, sometimes um, uh, uh, occasionally and uh, then I did but I did not find the, the horses and the, the, the relations to horses and horseback riding interesting in, in any uh, a specific way uh, until I experienced a uh, night's uh, tournament at the, the medieval center. It is an open air museum in, uh, in Denmark where I saw uh, knights on horses doing uh, all this uh, cool stuff with lances and swords and uh, whatnot. And I thought, well, that is uh, terrific. It's fantastic. I want to uh, be able to do that as well and then at an age of uh, 16 I started taking uh, horse uh, riding lessons uh, on my mom's um, Oldenburger mare because she told me that if I wanted to do anything like that I need, needed to be good at uh, dressage and uh, so I did uh, and then when I um, uh, got more and more into uh, this whole thing with uh, what you could call historical writing or trying to recreate the writing techniques uh, of the past uh, in a uh, show like a night's tournament, uh, then I became aware that uh, the way that it was done did not match the way that it was uh, portrayed, at least in the uh, medieval uh, uh, iconography. So specifically, how did a knight uh, how was a knight portrayed when he was riding in the Middle Ages? When you look at all the illustrations that you see in uh, various illuminated uh, manuscripts. Uh, so I became curious uh, about this uh, whole thing and it, motiva it motivated me further to uh, do it as a, as a professional thing. So I, uh, uh, I took a master's uh, degree in history from the University of Southern Denmark and uh, throughout my studies I was very interested and very keen in exploring this whole um, uh, historical uh, writing uh, techniques and how to recreate it uh, and uh, well because I was very much not into just uh, analyzing the iconography and the illuminated manuscripts, I also thought that uh, I wanted to do it in a practical way. Uh, I wanted to experience, experience uh, it on my own body and the relations with the horse. And that is why in 2009, I bought this uh, young uh, chap, this young fellow you see on the, um, on the photo, not the human being, of course, but the, but the horse. Uh, and I uh, named him Absalon. At this point, he was a young uh, one-year-old uh, stallion. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I wanted him to be my uh, companion in exploring uh, historic, historical writing uh, techniques. Um, and um, yeah, he was uh, one years old, so I could not uh, start uh, educate him or ride him or anything, but I wanted to, to 
uh, progress my own abilities uh, before I started writing him. So uh, I st did a three year, uh, not three years, sorry, three month um, length internship at a place where they teach uh, academic art of uh, writing uh, by Ben Brandel. Uh, and I spent three uh, months uh, de there during uh, summer um, with, uh, with another horse. Uh, where I was taught the fundamentals of uh, both the techniques behind academic art of writing and how you do uh, groundwork, uh, and also uh, a bit on how to uh, read and understand the horse um, during uh, the, the training. Uh, and uh, after that internship, I started my, uh, my education, uh, got a bachelor's degree, and as a part of my education, I did a seven-month uh, internship at uh, the Fürstliche Hofreitschule in uh, Bückeburg, uh, the princely riding school in uh, Bückeburg in uh, Germany. Uh, where I was able to bring my young boy, at that uh, stage he was uh, five years old, uh, so I could uh, write him in and uh, start his, his education. And he did uh, very well in uh, those uh, seven uh, months when we came. He was barely written in, I couldn't uh, uh, answer. I, did, I had done a little bit of uh, walk with him, a little bit of trot, and he couldn't count. And when we left, we were actually able to do um, canter pirouettes or at least we, we began the, uh, the work. So here we have the same horse uh, and the same uh, young man sitting on uh, the horse. Uh, and at this uh, photo, he is uh, uh, 13 years uh, old. Um, and um, yeah, uh, that is uh, what I, um, uh, the stage I have uh, been able to, to train him uh, to uh, now, we focus a lot of uh, still uh, trying to recreate the historical uh, iconography of the Middle Ages of the uh, of the re Renaissance of the of the Baroque uh, area where uh, area era uh, sorry uh, where the horse is uh, or the focus in the training is uh, very much uh, on collection. So that is uh, one of the. Um, uh, focuses uh, I have uh, in the training for both for uh, the practicality when you want to do uh, uh, war riding or mounted fencing or uh, something like that, then collection is very important and very uh, usable, but also so for uh, the horse's sake, uh, that uh, the horse, the more weight it can carry on its hind legs, uh, I believe, the more uh, healthy a horse can uh, move. So now I uh, live uh, on a farm in uh, Sweden. I am originally from Denmark, uh, but then I moved to Sweden in 2018 to live with my girlfriend, Nora. And we uh, have uh, both uh, um, uh, our own uh, business where we uh, teach uh, writing. Nora is uh, very good at uh, communicating and uh, interpreting uh, horses' uh, behavior. And uh, as you have also been talking about already, this whole thing with um, getting the owner to understand uh, what the horse's needs and what the horse is uh, trying to say. Uh, and of course, I am very uh, inspired by uh, that uh, whole thing um, uh, about understanding the relationship to your horse and applying it uh, to your training. Um, like uh, also uh, this uh, photo, again, uh, just uh, wanted to show this whole thing with uh, the collection and also wanting to uh, have a... Um, um, a respectful relationship to the horse. Uh, I also, um, as as part of uh, the um, the the exploration uh, of historical riding, I do um, mounted uh, ema. Uh, as uh, uh, Jack has already said, the historical European martial arts, um, where I focus a lot on uh, how I apply the classical or uh, Baroque uh, riding techniques in practice. So uh, wh why do you need to, your horse to be able to do a, a, a canter pirouette? 
well because it's very easy to uh, turn a horse uh, in a in a canter period why do you teach your horse lead change well because it's very usable if your if your opponent goes the other way then you can use do a lead change and uh, um chase your opponent i also do uh, shows um where I uh, mainly focus on the uh, late 14th century, early 15th century uh, period, um, and uh, use uh, my horse uh, for uh, jousting. Uh, I uh, give uh, lessons both on my horse and uh, to other horses. As I said, I own a business where I teach uh, historical riding, and uh, um, yeah, uh, this. Um, this is also something that I do. And uh, yeah, then I wanted to finish with this uh, picture uh, specifically, uh, because uh, as I said, um, I, uh, I am very much into or focused on recreating the medieval iconography uh, from the illuminated manuscripts. And uh, as a general rule, when you see um, uh, historical manuscripts, then you uh, very often uh, see uh, horses in what you could call uh, a carrière leap. That is the motion uh, Absalon is doing on uh, this uh, picture. That is where the uh, horse's uh, hind legs are in the ground and has leapt forward, um, uh, leaving the uh, front legs uh, above uh, the ground, and the rider's leg is uh, usually uh, very straightforward and down to deliver a um, a very uh, hard uh, blowing uh, lance uh, strike. Uh, so this is basically what I want to achieve with uh, my riding to uh, uh, recreate the uh, historical riding things, and I think. Uh, Concerning horse rider relations, uh, uh, because this is what we talk about uh, during this uh, roundtable talk, I think it's very important to say that um, uh, for me, uh, I couldn't do this with a horse that uh, needed to be forced uh, to, uh, to perform anything such as this. N not the riding, not the uh, historical uh, European martial arts, uh, mounted, uh, mounted fencing, uh, and uh, jousting. Uh, I need the horse to be uh, cooperative and uh, happy um, while performing these uh, exercises. And uh, to me, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very easy to say, well, of course, I want my horse to be happy and satisfied and cooperative when I, uh, when I perform these uh, shows and do these exercises. But I also think it's very important to uh, uh, say, how do you experience uh, or ask, uh, sorry, how do you experience that your horse is cooperative and happy in what you are doing? Uh, and to me, it is uh, very much about reading the expression uh, of your horse. Sometimes you cannot see it when you sit uh, on it, but you can definitely feel uh, feel it. Like, for instance, when you fence uh, against a, an opponent um, and you feel reluctance in the horse uh, to go near uh, another horse, well, then the, sim the horse uh, simply isn't uh, ready for it, or at least you need to work on the confidence of the horse to um, be able to perform what you want to do. Um, and the same thing goes with jousting. You shouldn't uh, have a, a tilt and a counter tilt to hold the horse uh, in uh, the lane where you can hit your opponent. If the horse wants to go out and it is reluctant and then you need to train that. So for me, a counter tilt is, um, yeah, uh, is not necessary if your horse wants to do the job. It, uh, it is as simple as that. Um, and that, as I said, has uh, very much to do with uh, what your horse, uh, how, how your uh, horse experience your uh, specific uh, relationship, uh, the horse uh, and uh, rider. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it's very, very important for me in all the training that the horse is happy and cooperative and they're satisfied with uh, what is uh, going on. So I guess basically 
that is all I wanted to uh, say. So thank you very much, Joachim, for this uh, wrap up. So we are kind of move, we're moving chronologically from nowadays to the past. And uh, what you mentioned, very important argument, um, is the horse willing to do what we are asking from it? That's, uh, I guess, the argument that was used for excluding uh, why, why equestrian sports might have to be excluded from the Olympic Games. People are saying, oh, you're making horses jump. You're making horses do this and that. And uh, for me, from my experience, I will, if, if the horse doesn't want to do something, it will not do it. Um, but of course, there are, that's one side. But of course, there are many ways how to make a horse. People are very clever at inventing all kinds of equipment and, and tools to make a horse do something. Yes, and, and uh, I think it's very important to also note that there are also uh, different uh, training uh, methods. Um, like, uh, I think it's a, a, a method uh, to uh, get a horse used to an extreme situation or a situation that it wants to get out of is, uh, I don't know if I can pronounce it right, but desynthesizing or something like that, that you basically um, force something that the horse uh, doesn't like upon it. Uh, let's say it's uh, afraid of a, of a cone. Then you force uh, the, the cone uh, upon it. And then the uh, horse, when it relaxes or stands still, then you remove it. And then you apply apply this until the horse is, uh, understands, oh, I can just stand still, and then uh, the, the scary cone is uh, removed. And uh, that could be considered a very, very gentle uh, training method. At least there's no uh, forcing or whipping or uh, uh, abusing uh, uh, behavior going on. Uh, but uh, you also teach the horse that if I just shut off, if I just shut off and just close my eyes, then it will go away. So you don't teach any curiosity, you don't uh, teach any consideration, you just teach it, if I can just do what I want to do against you, then uh, it will all be over soon. Um, and that is also uh, 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 a way of, of training a, a horse that is considered uh, nice, but can also be considered abusive. Also, I think it depends on uh, what we want to do with your with our horses. Anything can be abusive. And uh, years ago, I was working with like uh, clients who were, just came for one ride. Lots of them were saying, "Oh, but having an iron in the horse's mouth is cruel." And at this point, I was quite often using my horse who was going beatless. And people sometimes don't, don't even look at the mouth, but say it's cruel to use iron in a horse's mouth and beat. I say, well, look at this horse. First of all, it's not cruel. Second, it doesn't have a beat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like people have been watching uh, all kinds of programs and thinking, oh, this is cruel. And I mean, you can be cruel without iron in a horse's beat. Uh, without yes. a, uh, you can be cruel without a bridle at all if you really want to. It's, it's a bit harder, but you can succeed in this. So how what do we want to form a relationship with the horses what do we want to teach you i think we are we have people who are teaching horses who are training people as well and um, katarina has also her experience of um, finding how to how to get a relationship with the horses she said living in the stable for three or more months um, um so how do we understand this relationship between the horse and the rider? Or, and what, what are we spreading if we are training people? What kind of thing we are projecting? So, um, does somebody want to speak? Do you uh, have like... Is that, is that a question for the floor or for Katarina? Uh, it, it's a question for everybody. Um, what, one thing that I, um, it come, come, kind of comes back to what I see very much in, in um, fencing and uh, come, come, Hima on a 
competitive level. A lot of times people try and uh, subscribe all kinds of rules on what should and should not make sense in a uh, simulation of a fight. If I attack, the other person should defend, right? However, unfortunately, when you go back through historical manuscripts and accounts of combat, it's very common that um, a panicked opponent will just uh, reply with a completely illogical attack to, to yourself. Um, and that resulted off of combatants being killed. So it's not some, the only way to understand before something happens, what's gonna happen is experience. You can the only way you're going to understand what an have a good opponent will do if he does it is by having many, many, many interactions with different kinds of fencers. Fen horses are very much a similar thing. It's a communication. You cannot put rules on communication. People are going to have opinions. Horses are going to have opinions. They're going to have stress. Is going to interact with them in different ways. Anybody who's been an athlete has seen how stress can have positive or negative effects and you black out and something happens and then, or your something slows down and everything happens in super detail. It can happen either way. Um, I think one sad thing is that, uh, especially with pentathlon that is so focused on being able to adapt to a horse so quickly that many athletes, unfortunately, as Katarina said, don't seem to have the same background in many, 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 many different horses you would need to be able to see to adapt like the original competitors might have, who were mostly cavalry officers who had to adapt to many horses. I had the dubious uh, uh, privilege of doing, of having a military service involving horses and you end up working with many different horses, some with not great backgrounds, some with good, good backgrounds and you have to adapt and do whatever someone is telling you to do. And I think it's very sad that that is something that is being asked of athletes in a modern sport without that background. Okay, thank you, Jack. Thank you for sharing this perspective. Uh, Katarina, maybe you could do you have anything to add to this? What is your uh, experience, your, your opinion, or somebody else wants to say something about? Uh, okay, Joachim has a raised hand. Joachim, you are welcome to speak. Uh, well, I think um, uh, at least a very uh, important question um, uh, in this uh, in this matter is um, uh, well, at least uh, in in concerning relations uh, to to horses. I, I I think that many people can agree. Well, of course, just as I said, the horses need to be um, cooperative. They need to be happy. They need to uh, be. Um, uh, yeah, enjoying the, both the training, uh, whatever kind of training you're, you're doing. Uh, but what I think is very important is that how and when do we experience that our horse is happy during the training? Because um, at least uh, compared to reading medieval sources on, um, on how a horse should be behave during uh, the training, then it, a medieval source can say, well, the horse should be happy and joyful. But uh, okay, and then we then we could just accept it as proof that uh, a horse should be happy and joyful. But we also need to take into into consideration how did these people experience that their horses were happy and joyful, um, because what some people might experience as a happy and, and joyful horse, some other people uh, might experience as uh, self taught helplessness. Uh, that the horses, as I just uh, explained earlier, would just shut off uh, and just go. If I'm just, uh, if I just close my eyes, then it will all be over soon. So yeah, I think it's also a general question: How do we experience that the horse is happy and joyful? Oh, well, that's a good question. So, um, what, what does it mean to have a joyful horse for for you? Yeah, and uh, I would. Uh, very much uh, like to to go uh, first um, uh, as I said uh, during my presentation that the, the horse I don't know I don't want it to shy away from uh, what I am uh, doing I wanted to uh, approach the object the opponent whatever um, with confidence 
uh, and I can do this uh, in training, uh, of course. And then I also want to um, uh, experience uh, from the groundwork when I am able to look at the horse that uh, the way that the uh, horse is communicated, uh, communicating with facial uh, expressions, that it is actually happy about the situation and not, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of, uh, you can just uh, Google the horse pain face and then you'll see horses with kind of very low eyebrow and you just, you know, shut off. And some people will say, oh, it's so relaxed. And other people will say, no, it's actually uh, very much in trauma just now. Um, so yes, that's what I focus on. I don't know what, what you other guys are, are focusing on when you train your horses. Okay, so what about others? How do you experience that the horse is or is not happy? Well, Cynthia has got a raised hand, so maybe Cynthia has got also a question, comment to the participants, Bill? Feel free. I wanted to, if I could, just add to what uh, Joaquin was saying, that um, I think it's important to ride a lot of different horses, even a lot of different breeds and different styles um, from the beginning, not just after you're more experienced on one or two horses, because there are things that you pick up along the way from horses with different personalities, um, different backgrounds that you will later understand better even early on, I was on a horse one time when I was a beginner and it was tossing its head and the instructor said, I know this horse, he's just looking for your hands, shorten your reins. Now, 30 years later, I can tell when a horse is looking for my hands rather than just throwing its head around. And this experience of horses is so um, all of the five senses that I think that's why sometimes scholars get it wrong because they haven't actually been there in contact or they knew one horse and with its own personality. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Okay, thank you. If other people have questions or comments, you're welcome. Um, yes. I wanted to agree, first of all, with what uh, Joachim was saying about the desensitization. Um, because, I don't know, for, for, for me, there is not such a thing as he was saying that of a horse that is desensitized, that is dull to his surrounding. Um, a horse could feel a fly landing on him, on him and I do not want to, want to take off the sensitivity that a horse has of feeling that fly. So it is more about the separation of what I present to a horse. Uh, sometimes I work with something that's called just a flag. It's a stick and it's got a flag at the end. Uh, and that can be something that I do not want my horse to uh, react to. So it means nothing in that moment for the horse. It's just there. It's just something that he's got in his surrounding. And sometimes uh, that flag, it is the same flag. It is the consequence of if he doesn't move out, what's gonna happen? The flag is gonna step in and it's going to uh, follow through do it to the intention of me asking my horse to move out. So uh, that is something that I am looking uh, answering to the question of what am I looking into when I work with the horse? That is something that I uh, want the horse to 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 uh, to achieve this separation between something that it shouldn't be bo bothered from, or something that he should still respect and 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 uh, and respond to to something that we haven't mentioned yet. Uh, I don't, I, at least I, I didn't hear it in this conversation yet, uh, but it's something that it's very important and everyone has their own and it's feel. And what is your feel for the horse? What do you think that the horse needs in that moment? What are you presenting your horse? Uh, feel is related to a lot of different things. It can be into your hands, into your body, 
can be your body language, could be your uh, your energy, how uh, you interact with the horse. So if my feel, for example, we were talking of a horse that has got maybe a sleepy eye, I have a little red roan horse. He tends to be quite very relaxed. And the moment that I give him a, a break, he's just kind of like tunes off. He makes a great movie horse. We, Jack and I train horses for films as well. So it makes a great movie horse because he can just shut down. But it doesn't mean that if someone would take a picture and think, oh, that horse is like shutting down. It's like, well, he's just kind of like going into his happy place because I didn't ask him to do a job in that moment. So he can just sit there. However, if I re-raise my energy, he's, he's really young. He's only four and a half years old. Uh, but if I raise my energy in that moment and I offer my, that horse to go somewhere, he will go somewhere safely, no, no panic, uh, quite relaxed. <laughs> uh, but this is something that is, it is important for me. And it, I know I, I've been spacing between the feel for the horse and this separation and keeping that curiosity and, and, and sensitivity into, into the horse. But uh, it's, they, they're both very important for me. So that's one to just, it's the, the, feel, the, the part of the feel is something that I would like to hear also from, from other people. And it's not something you can, you can really teach to someone. You can, I find it is you can expose people to different situations where they can improve their own feel by also like riding hundreds of thousands of different horses. Uh, but yeah, I can't bring my feel and put it into someone. I can't teach that part. I can just expose the people and expose the horses. And, and then hopefully we all get to have a better idea of what, what we should do with the horse in a specific moment on that day with that horse, because they, it's always different. So um, that's it. Okay, so the subject is the feel for the horse. How do you understand this? Katerina Svetlana, how do you learn this? And if you are training somebody, how do you teach this? If having a feel for the horse. We are talking, for example, about the human, about sportists, young sportists. I, I, I can say that it's also with experience, with the experience to understand the horse, yeah, to get the situations as much as possible. Yeah, uh, bad situations, good situations, it's all your experience and a lot of years. Okay, yes, yeah. If, if you have anything else to add, Svetlana, you're welcome. I don't know what to say else. Everything's had said before. <laughs> Work hard, get good, same thing every day. Yes, and also, in my opinion, it's sometimes uh, having difficult horses um, as well, which, which helps. Okay, so we have people with raised hands. We have Joachim and Sarah Duncan. So okay, maybe Joachim could speak first and then Sarah could speak next. Yeah, uh, well, I just want to uh, answer the whole uh, feeling uh, thing, uh, I uh, definitely agree that experience uh, can do a lot. Uh, but I also think that it, um, uh, as in many other things, that uh, people, the specific person and the specific character has something to say. Uh, that uh, if you are, uh, I don't know if you can say that in English, but empathetic. If you if you're uh, if you're very if you have very much empathy in your personality that you're very good at uh, reading other living beings that being uh, humans dogs or, or just understanding their emotions uh, and i also think that you have at least an advantage where regarding the whole feeling uh, thing that you um, yeah that you understand uh, other uh, that you understand uh, other living uh, beings and their need and of course there's a lot to 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 learn from experience from just doing it but I also think that uh, being uh, empathetic uh, uh, and sympathetic uh, can uh, improve that whole thing. 
thank you very much, Joachim. And uh, yes, uh, so did Sarah want to ask or say anything? I wanted to ask actually the people who are training horses professionally. Um, it's a very interesting round table, thank you. I haven't trained horses professionally, although I've ridden pretty well all my life. Not long ago, I went to a Spanish national stud in Jerez. Um, we were told a story of a horse that was fully trained that they then sold to an owner. And the owner came back and said, I can't do anything with this horse at all. So they said, well, bring it back and we'll see what's the problem. No problem. They called the owner back with the horse there. And as soon as they saw the horse saw the owner, it started snorting and pawing the ground. So it obviously had been, um, they reckon it had been ill-treated and it was not going to work for this particular owner. Now, I wonder how many of you tra who are training horses have that problem and how do you get over the fact that some of these horses that you're training so beautifully are not going to be treated or respected as they should be? I mean, how can you train the person if they're not going to, you know, be sensitive to the way the horse is trained or the horse's temperament? It's very hard. That's it. That's the question. <laughs> That's a great question, actually. Good question. Yeah. Um, like, it, ba the short answer is you can't. Um, <laughs> I didn't want you to say that. <laughs> well, um, so I can give you the answer that uh, was given by the King of Portugal in 1435 um, in response to the perceived drop of horsemanship ability inside his court which then led to military defeat of his army in Morocco, according to him, uh, and the subsequent imprisonment of his little brother. He blamed in specific the fall of manly arts such as fighting, wrestling, jousting, fencing, uh, hunting, and the rise of pursuits that were more uh, less masculine such as tennis, running, dancing, music, and that how those had become popular and the uh, there was no longer prestige uh, associated with the, the sport, warlike sports. Um, and so he basically created, wrote a book and created a campaign within his court to denounce these um, uh, other sports and create opportunities to publicly humiliate the uh, courtiers who are bad at writing. So I guess the answer to your question is we create state sponsors of an events where we humiliate people who cannot write. I'm the <laughs> I mean, Dom Duarte, it's Dom Duarte you're talking about, is it? Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's a horrible example, wasn't there, at the Olympics with the pentathlon where some, I can't remember what nationality he was, he was beating his horse because it wouldn't perform properly. And that was heartbreaking to see. Yeah, I mean, it's it was a it's unfortunate. It's a really unfortunate uh, situation to put both athletes in, um, both the yeah. horse and the rider, um, and that I think has to go into the organization of the yeah. event because anybody I, I personally, as someone who competes uh, in many different disciplines in what I do, and uh, has to or adapt to many different rule sets, including pentathlon, triathlon formats. Um, an athlete will always will usually gravitate towards training for the um, disciplines that are have the fewest variables. In pentathlon, that is very clearly uh, running, swimming, and shooting. Those have very few variables um, compared. compared to riding a horse you do not know yeah. and fencing one pass. This is a sport where you usually win out of have you win like something eight to 13, but there's one pass. You get that wrong, you lose the match, you move on, you fight another person. Those are, so fencing and the riding aspects of pentathlon are incredibly variable, incredibly chaotic. So if you're smart and you wanna win, why would you spend a lot of time training that when you could ride, when you can uh, swim and run and shoot mm -hmm. as much as you can, gain a whole bunch of points there uh, the running, it's a timed thing, but you can, you, you start later, uh, you get a better time to start if you get better um, 
give out our scores if I remember correctly. But uh, I think it is just sad. And I think you could change a lot of the formatting with different rule sets, but I'm not qualified to say, I'll leave that to people who actually do the sport. Um, okay. Thank you. Al Katerina Formula, she will have to leave in like 10 minutes. So maybe we could give her a word and uh, um, yeah, maybe she could say something about uh, uh, last word about her experience in uh, building a relationship with different horse in just 20 minutes before the event. How do you do it? Yeah. Yes, of course, I can talk about it. About, about the horse, uh, generally, I can't uh, say uh, a lot because actually I train horses uh, only four years. As I said, I started at the age of 17. But uh, about the relationship before competition, yes, it's true. We have 20 minutes to uh, get to know the horse. And also before the competition, we can see so-called uh, test jump, where the professional horse owners of the horses uh, jump the horse course um, with the horse, horse, so we can we can see it. Uh, but then, actually, when you do it by yourself, it's totally dif different because the owner knows his horse. He knows what to do before the obstacle, how the horse reacts, but we don't know it. And imagine that we train uh, only for years. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really like a lottery. Also, not just with the horse, but... Uh, uh, everything, there are so many factors. Uh, horse, yes, so <laughs> uh, it's it's a house, yes. It's a big, big house and big lottery. But it's a pent pentathlon. Everyone in the uh, sport field choose, have chosen this sport. So we are okay with it. We are used to it. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And just a quick question: What? Uh, how are you going to compete this year after this change? Is it still riding, or are you going to do something different? In your yes. Yeah. I would. Change, our rules a little bit changed because normally horse riding was only a third discipline. It was uh, and there was fencing, uh, swimming, then horse riding, and then laser run event. And now horse riding will be as the first discipline only in the final, super final. And uh, so it's, it's the biggest rule. Also, the obstacles now will be a little bit easier and lower. Uh, but the, the rules uh, generally in horse riding even didn't change. And it will be uh, like that till the Olympic Games, as I already said, and then horse riding will be excluded. So uh, this season will be in a little bit uh, new format, but no big changes. Okay, and uh, let's wish uh, Katerina good luck and uh, that she uh, will find. Thank you. Final question. I'd be really interested to say what kind of the uh, how much of the time percentagely she feels most pentathlon athletes spend on the riding. Just I'd be fascinated because it's five disciplines. You have to divide that time. On horse riding uh, during the winter preparation, we do trainings two times, three times a week. But when we have a competitions and training camps abroad. It's possible to don't have horse, horse riding at all in one month, month and half, depends on the duration of the training camp abroad. So. Thanks. Thank you. And let's give a round of applause to Katerina for coming here today. That was Thank really you. great. It was nice to be with you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye, thank you. Just, uh, I mean, for, for me, it's amazing to have just 20 minutes and then go and perform with the horse uh, you've just seen in test rides. Um, but, uh, yeah, very brave uh, discipline for brave people. We, we have a similar uh, experience on, on films. Uh, I was doubling an actress on a 
couple of movies last uh, fall and it's not a competition but they they gave me a horse and I had to ride the horse through fire through a camp on fire gallop the horse through the field in a, a viking dress and that that was it <laughs> without knowing the horse nothing not the tack not the saddle nothing at all off you go and it's I was really lucky they gave me a nice horse or well they're all nice horses but they gave me a horse that was used to fire and I could do the job properly but it was yeah it wasn't a competition but the cameras was all were on and we had to film it so that was that had put a little bit of pressure on me <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting but as a olympic uh, rider and trainer under he died now but he was active like uh, in the 50s 60s 70s as a trainer he had an idea for show jumping competitions where riders would swap horses uh, at, at one point in the finals or somewhere to show that a, a good rider can ride any horse really well. Otherwise, it's just one pair which works. Maybe he's not, he won't be a very good rider with a different horse. So that was one idea which didn't take off in France. But he, he had other ideas how to make show jumping more interesting and more a center on, on the rider's skill um, and uh, rather than... Uh, on talented horses, which couldn't jump anything. Um, but um, the idea was there. But you know, talking, talking about this modern pentathlon, I think that uh, historically it will lose the essence when the riding even will exclude from it. Yes, many people were also saying that it's not the mm. same thing. I mean, historically, the the purpose of it was to simulate uh, the greatest challenges that a cavalryman might face, getting shot, his horse shot, and having to ride back into enemy, back to uh, friendly territory on a different horse, fighting a number of different enemies, shooting a pistol, blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, so you are kind of losing the historical purpose, whether you can, you could argue, however, the historical purpose is gone, but the original intent is no longer there. If there's Yes, uh, and Joachim also uh, wants, wanted to comment something. Uh, yeah, that was just the, um, well, also uh, concerning the, uh, uh, the uh, competition that has been mentioned and what you said about, you know, a good rider should be able to, to uh, uh, ride um, all kinds of different horses. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, at, at least that's, that also makes me ask, uh, are we uh, allowed uh, or how do we allow ourselves to uh, sit on horses? Uh, you know, uh, uh, can we just, uh, well, uh, let's say uh, in the relations to the horse, you know, I, I have a right. I am a human being. I can ride you if I want to. Uh, are we allowed to, uh, to, uh, to say that and just uh, do it, ex uh, exploit um, uh, animals in, in that way? Um, and uh, that whole thing is, is a very good question. And at least here uh, in Sweden, there, uh, there is a, what you could call a community that, you know, goes very much against this whole, this whole thing. But what about the horse? What kind of uh, right does the, does uh, the horse uh, have? And how can we make sure that the horse is actually able to and willing to make us uh, ride it? And I think that there is a very good connection also historically with, uh, the, with how slaves were perceived, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, I don't know, 150 years ago or something like that. Um, that, uh, well, that's just a slave. You can do whatever you, would, you want to against them. And then there are people saying, but no, look at, the, look at them. They are human beings. They have, they have rights as well. And people would just laugh about it. Uh, and I think that there are very many um, uh, things that can be compared uh, in that whole thing with how we perceive horses and what we are allowed to do with them. And, uh, and that also uh, goes again uh, uh, to, uh, back to the whole question, well, if we are allowed to do something with them, how do we make sure that the horse enjoy what we are doing with them? Um, 
then yeah, uh, just um, uh, something uh, also to take into consideration with this whole thing. What are we allowed to do? Thank it's you, very, Joachim. That's a very good ethical argument. Uh, yeah. yeah, I find it very interesting what uh, Joachim was saying of the, uh, how, how do you make sure your horse is enjoying it? It's, it's, it is a very difficult question to answer for me, at least. And I mean, it's very easy to feel when the horse is enjoying what he's doing, but it's difficult to to probably explain it a little bit more. Like I did have, uh, I have a couple of pictures, uh, one second that I wanted to uh, show, one second. And sometimes you see a horse that is very determined on uh, what the job that he's doing. And perhaps it looks, it doesn't really look like the, the horse is having the best fun uh, but they are it, but they are it's just it's just their way of showing that determination if you look at this mare uh, her ears are flat back there and she's she's doing a job she's doing she's cutting the cow out of the herd and she enjoys her job so much that if anybody of you knows cow working a cow would turn usually 180 degrees to try to go back to the herd and sometimes you get cows that are a little bit dull they're a little bit kind of like they've been worked a bunch and they don't feel like the need of moving really fast and go back to the herd well this mare if she wouldn't feel that the cow was moving fast enough she would stump the foot on the ground to make the cow move faster because she enjoyed to work that cow so much. And, but if you look at the picture, it doesn't really look like the face of a happy horse. <laughs> or uh, where is the other one? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Where is she? There she is here. That's the rescue thoroughbred. Again, she has a very determined face. It might does not look like it's a happy horse, but she is determined on getting the job done. I was stabbing the guy on the ground and I, we do sometimes have interns that stay on the ground or part of the people of the team and we use them, uh, and use them is a bad word maybe just to use it, but we, we, we pretend that these people are, are cows. So they think that she, she thinks that he is a cow and he should cut the cow or she, he should, she should go after that cow. And again, it's probably not, it doesn't really look like it's a, it, it's a horse. It's a magical unicorn with a happy face, but this horse, I can pretty much guarantee you that in that moment, she was 100% focused on the job and she what, did want to get it done as best as she could. So that's just my... Um, I, I think also that just kind of dragging it also, you get the same thing if you're coaching children a little bit. Some children are not great at communication and they may not be there because they wanted to be. They were brought there by their parents. Um, and you can very quickly find out which ones are actually enjoying the sport and which ones aren't. And usually the main factor is, are they offering more than you are asking? If you ask for something, do they do more? Will they do an extra lap? Will they want to go back and do another round of sparring? Will they do this? And, you know, back to, and humans, like some humans live for a boxing ring. Some will just want to go back. You, they get out of the gym. They want to go back and get hit again and hit other people. You put another person in a boxing ring and it would be abuse. It's assault. So it's that very difficult thing. And, you know, you take a picture of an athlete they don't look like they're having fun, but they want to be there. Like most athletes are, look, you take a photo of a marathon runner, they do not look happy. 
but there's something that makes them want to do it. There's some kind of pride they get. There's some kind of uh, something they get out of it. Some horses, when they do mounted combat, they, they feel a status boost. They feel pride. They feel that I can push other horses around and they like that. Um, they feel that they're no longer powerless in the situation. They can make something move. They're no longer prey. They have become a predator combined with another predator. Um, like, and you see that also in some descriptions of war horses. So I think it's a, like, I, I wish we could actually make horses be able to sign waivers and say, I love, want to do this. But until then, we just have to watch them and try and figure it out, in my opinion. But I think Joachim has a... Yeah, Joachim wanted to also to add something. Yeah, well, I just uh, wanted to answer it uh, uh, that... Uh, that of course uh, that you, you that you that from understanding that you as you showed uh, Alicia the, the photos that uh, perhaps these horses don't look happy but they 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 are and I completely agree that of course a, a, a horse can show a happy face in uh, more uh, versions uh, than one um, and uh, for me just uh, so I know that I've said it that uh, of course a, a, a horse can show uh, aggression uh, to boost uh, confidence just as long as you don't um, uh, promote the aggression that you want to get more aggressions at least I've seen uh, riders train their horses in that way and, and I don't uh, think that that is a very pleasant uh, way uh, to to encourage the the aggression uh, of the horse but it can be uh, perhaps a, an angle towards uh, um, encouraging the confidence uh, of uh, the horse and I also think what uh, Jack uh, said um, uh, also in another, another way of putting it is uh, just uh, considering the personality of the horse you know some horses they should not be forced into doing mounted combat because they are too scared or too nervous or they, or they have tra trauma from a, from a life before that uh, just doesn't suit the amount of stress that you put into a, a situation uh, of, of a mounted fencing situation. Or you just need to spend a lot of time reteaching the horse. Uh, horse. Uh, and then the, this thing with um, with the with the child that uh, that uh, you know some some children are being um, uh, or ha ha had been taught have been uh, taught uh, or put there by their by their parents uh, and of course um, the, I think it's very important that you can actually uh, ask uh, a horse to do something that it is reluctant to do but through the right pedagogical educational method you can actually teach it to do it uh, anyway uh, but I just thought this whole comparison with uh, and uh, children uh, was very good because uh, in general, I would say that um, the the relationship to uh, to a horse and the horse you have uh, your that is your responsibility to train is kind of the same as uh, adopting a child. Uh, so it's not uh, something that you have any um, uh, how do you say uh, genealog genealogical uh, connection with, but it's something you adopt and you need to take care of the uh, horse's uh, personality and make it uh, the best version uh, of itself. So thank you very much uh, for this, uh, Joachim. And uh, historical is a comparison between a child and the horse. It's very important in many training uh, books where you have Basically, the same words applied. You educate a horse, you don't train it, or you don't. You are educating it. Many people are using this language. Um, of course, we need to educate both the horse, sometimes the rider as well. There was some discussion in the chat about mounted archery. So, if Andrew wants to uh, say more, what? Uh, um, um, what uh, he thinks about mounted archer and any issues uh, there. Um. Uh, yeah. Um, basically, yeah. As I said, there's a lot I could I could say, but um, basically, one thing we could start with is the what Joachim was saying about the um, counter tilt. Um, I mean, what a lot of horse archery, the revival of horse archery on the world started with was, you know, some of these straight 
tracks of 100 meters with um, two barriers uh, with ropes or something similar running down both sides, um, which actually does, uh, at least in one manuscript, actually appear as sort of being used for some exercises for horse archery. Uh, but that was far from the only thing they were doing. <laughs> um, so um, basically this, you know, has its function, but isn't, uh, if you only do this one thing uh, all the time with your horse, uh, your horse will have, you know, will, will not get very much good training. Will, if it's fearful, will just rush down the, the track, you know, what, what um, Johan Kim was saying, close the eyes and then it's over. And of course, then, you know, the horse can get faster and faster and faster because the faster you go, the faster it's over. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, there's that sort of just one example there. Um, but it does, I think it does go to show as well, though, how um, um, it, uh, we need to be careful all the time when we're interpreting historical manuscripts and thinking that this is just a small glimpse of everything they're doing. And we constantly need to search for more and more context to build the picture a lot more. Um, and I might just throw in there a little tidbit that you know, just because there are some, what we view now as cruel methods and maybe objectively can be said in general as cruel methods of tools or whatnot in historical manuscripts, uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're actually doing this at that time um, or at, at maybe hardly any time. It may just be something that, you know, comes from the, for example, the textual transmission of a manuscript. So someone read it in another, and that author um, then incorporated it in his own text. And then uh, maybe the original person who wrote this didn't even do it, just uh, it was someone's idea at one point. I was never put into action. Just a little side note there. Um, and just finishing with the whole sort of larger picture of sort of how horse archery grew as a modern sport. Um, very quickly, you know, going down in a straight line, 100 meters, with a um, horse is not very difficult for a rider or horse. Um, so this sort of created the conditions for this to grow very rapidly. Uh, so, you know, before you knew it, you, you had international competitions, uh, partly because everyone was so spread out. Um, and uh, this is a way to gather people together but uh, as well, you know, this created a lot of problems too, just with, you have things growing very fast. And then there are some people questioning, wait, what are we actually, what direction are we actually going here? And, and is this really good direction for, you know, creating the right system in which to train horses well for Eastern equestrian martial arts? Um, and um, as well as, you know, get, encourage people to properly work on riding skills, not just work to be a passenger, basically. So I'll leave it there. Okay, Joachim has something to respond, right? Yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I just thought it was a good uh, comment uh, from uh, Andrew. Um, and I thought it was uh, important uh, as an important remark uh, to what uh, he also said, this whole thing that he said, there's one sort saying that in mounted archery you can go in a lane. Uh, and I think it's so important when you want to recreate these historical situations that you also focus on representativity. You know, what did the majority actually do? Yes, there are examples of uh, tournaments going on with a tilt and a counter tilt, but the, the, there aren't that many and actually these persons who did it they were able to do it without any tilt at all they would do it at large as it was called without any tilt just go at the, your opponent um, and then the horses uh, there was a risk of the horses colliding and then you develop the tilt to uh, prevent the horses from uh, colliding and again uh, with uh, with the relation uh, uh, with a relation to your horse, uh, I believe that it says something about your um, uh, standard of training. If you can ride an opponent uh, with very uh, limited uh, vision uh, and hit uh, your opponent with a lance uh, on your horse without a tilt, um, uh, then you are uh, skilled and the, the horse also 
at least I would I would like to believe that most horses in the Middle Ages were keen on performing the um, uh, 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 the the task. I just on the historical level, like asking of what is the what was the historical level of skill and is a very difficult question to ask. And in some cases, we have some indications mostly mostly on what is the perceived average skill level and request re, prerequisites of the uh, training games used and that's basically the only form from actual military standards that we know of as far as performance ability we do not have like a platoon performance report sent back to high command and you know company performance reports etc unfortunately that would be great to have um but like I, that's why I find the Dom Duarte example fascinating because in the course of one generation, we have, if he is to be believed, a huge drop in athletic ability, um, mainly in, you could say, a lack of state sponsorship. Um, it was no longer considered a priority of the crown for a certain amount of time, so it was no longer pushed heavily uh, on a with national funding, um, which is something you see in modern sports today, like modern sports rise and fall with how much attention they get uh, from funding bodies. Um, and sometimes they rise independently, but I think it's, it, uh, nature works in bell curves, like, and how much, how, and you can always, just because that was the standard doesn't mean people always live up to it. Dom Duarte, talks about all kinds of bad practices going on. Were there excellent jousters going on? Definitely. The question is figuring out what the parameters of that bell curve are is, um, and what is the representative, as Joachim says. I think basically as modern protective practitioners are trying to reconstruct these arts, we can just aim to be as good as we can and do harder and harder things until you know we lose out. But I think we'll have to figure out a way of uh, also more subsidizing our own performance and training abilities, um, much how early pentathlon was by hiring uh, cavalry officers or recruiting. Yeah, so that's a very good point you made, Jack, that uh, we think that uh, people in the Middle East are good at riding horses. Dom Duarte is writing that you shouldn't have servants who are leading and poking your horse to the tilt. You should have a horse which is which is going there. You should be able to guide your horse. And it just shows that bad horsemanship it ever always existed. And it got to the top level at some point because these people got to jousting. And that's what we saw in modern pentathlon, bad horsemanship that exists and people who are coming. Um, I, would, I would point out that period jousting, it didn't have have, as far as we can tell, it didn't have a, like a knockout system in the same way that we would in modern competition. So it's not like everybody got to joust who was part it, a part to partook in it. Um, so it may have been they didn't reach very high in the competition, but it's very modern uh, period jousting didn't seem to have like uh, like an elimination system in the same way that or as kind of like or a high level like varying levels. They may have been invitational, but. If you had the money, you usually took part, it seems, from the sources. Okay, maybe also Svetlana can uh, say something. What, what, uh, what is your perspective about uh, all this? Uh, you mentioned that there are some new themes uh, for future, future issues, future discussion. Uh, Svetlana? Yeah. I haven't heard something. Yes, so what, what are your thoughts about this? So we've been talking about uh, like historical writing and disciplines which grew out of historical writing. Maybe you could say something about uh, this, how it today applies we, today, to, yes. Today, today we spoke about a lot of things and a lot of very sensitive things. And all, all these sensitive, uh, things like feeling and so on it could be discussed in the future also but uh, but 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 it should take a long time more long time than today 
Okay, that's a good suggestion. I would actually love to see people also in real time and discuss it in real time rather than over screen. It's got some advantages because we can have people from all over the world in one place uh, on Zoom, but uh, sometimes um, in-person discussion is uh, better. And um, yeah, so um, one question I wanted to raise, we have uh, like those sports which are his equestrian sports which are historical, but which uh, come out just now. So we have mountain archery, which is a historical sport, but it sort of emerged very recently. Same with the uh, hammer on horseback. And we have those sports which are, uh, which have been here for a long, comparatively long time, okay? So jumping, dressage, uh, eventing, modern pentathlon, they've all been here for 100 years and more. Uh, so in future, what do you think will happen? Do you think this uh, new sports will become more prominent or not? Oh, okay, also Western riding. Um, what do you think uh, those historical sports will be facing the same problems if they come into the limelight? What, what will happen? What do you think? You're asking to me, yeah? Oh, yes, uh, we can start with you, Svetlana. I think every discipline has uh, has its own starting, uh, historical starting. And if we are talking about Latvia, I think that we will not see someday this Western riding here in Latvia. Maybe somebody will try, but we will hold these classical disciplines here, like European country and because we have we have this agriculture and horses uh, and all this history in this way yeah we, we just have three disciplines i guess at the moment uh, dressage show jumping and uh, driving yeah yeah okay driving came also not so long uh, long ago Yes. Uh, I think Joachim uh, raised. Yes, Joachim can also say something. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, um, uh, I think uh, that uh, well, on on a larger perspective, perhaps a few hundred years uh, into the future, I think that. Uh, uh, what we today call our right to uh, let's say exploit uh, animals riding them killing them eating them and such that will you will see a, a decrease of uh, that kind of um, behavior uh, to, toward uh, animals uh, very close to the uh, analogy i made earlier to slavery that uh, at some point that was com uh, considered completely natural of course everyone could own human beings uh, and today we uh, shake our heads and think it's uh, awful. I, I can't say for sure, of course, but I think that uh, um, such a, a development could be um, happening also in the near future. Thank you, Joachim. That's actually the discussion with which we started uh, uh, some months ago on Messenger with Joachim, because uh, I like his perspective. I just don't see it. Um, some people know me well, know that I've got three horses, two of them are rescue horses, and I'm not, I didn't set out as a person who wants to have a sanctuary for rescue horses, I don't like helping others, I don't donate to charities, not, not a lot, I didn't set out to rescue horses, they just came my way, I have a Zora bread, like Alessia, Zora breads are often rescue horses, I just retired her last year because of an injury she got while playing in the field, and then I've got a blind horse who is also a rescue horse. It's not me who rescued her, but her previous owners. It's a complicated story. Rescued her and then didn't know what to do with this horse. And then I said, yeah, I want a blind horse. Who wouldn't want an old blind horse who is shy and scared of people? Um, but that's the way it happened. And um, 
unfortunately, I don't see uh, just now how violence to animals is going to cease. Um, okay, so we've got just four minutes of our discussion left. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everybody for participating and joining and uh, our wonderful speakers who came to discuss these sensitive topics and um, coming from very, very different perspectives and looking at this, it's a challenge. And um, thank you. <laughs> if uh, people have any suggestions, what are other topics for lectures, for seminars, for roundtables you want to see? We've got two more events for this academic year and then for next academic year, I'm open to suggestions. Um, and the next uh, virtual event will be in the third week of April, it's 20 something of April, and it will be about a seminar about uh, historic, about horsemanship as a cultural legacy. We will have four speakers and uh, later send out the information against okay, the 21st of April. So any, if somebody wants to have a final word, um, you're welcome. <laughs> Just not to leave it on a dark note with me on my rescue horses. Um, who feel very well. Um, and the blind horse is not very shy. She's, uh, she's found her way. Um, in our little herd, so it's not not a sad story. Um, so if no, we can call it a day. And th thank you again for coming and for talking. Um,